Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to this morning's session. I'm Nairi Woods. I'm Dean of the Blavatnik School of Government at Oxford University. And we're meeting this morning to consider how it is that Nigeria might face one of the most serious double crises the nation has ever addressed. That's the double whammy of the COVID-19 crisis and the oil price crash. We're, jo we're joined by an extraordinary panel and audience, including each one of you. Ike Borje, Ike Mokwede, the founder of the Africa Initiative for Governance. Professor Sir Paul Collier, who has been working and uh, reflecting and advising Nigerian governments for several decades. The Vice President of the World Bank, Chela Pazabashola, um, who brings the experience of many of the other countries with whom the World Bank is working. And Nigeria's Head of Service, Folashade Yemi Esan. Thank you, Nairi. From time to time, I'm asked this question. Um, and the question is, what is, what is AIG? Are you DFID? Uh, are you an African DFID? And I say, no. Uh, my answer is simple. We are an independent, non-state, uh, not-for-profit institution. Uh, we believe very strongly that by transforming leadership in government, we can transform Africa's socioeconomic performance. We provide funding, we provide training, we provide mentorship, we are strong advocates for reform. And um, when we see um, strong reformers like the head of service, uh, Dr. Esson, we actually partner with them and get into the, tre you know, the trenches of, of reform. Nigeria today faces the double whammy of uh, a virus pandemic uh, and an oil crash. Um, and I like to think of um, uh, crisis as platforms for change. I'd like now to turn to Professor Sir Paul Collier. Paul, I, Boje puts the terrific challenges that Nigeria faces um, and where it sits vis-a-vis -vis other countries in front of us. How, in your view, should it address this challenge? The style of leadership which is needed now is not commander-in-chief, it's communicator-in-chief. Because um, it's very important. Gov the, the, the government sector in Nigeria is itself really pretty small um, relative to the society and the economy. And so the communicator-in-chief role is to um, guide what business should be doing, what people living in households should be doing, what social enterprise should be doing, what communities should be doing. Um, to work as a communicator-in-chief you need a very different sort of behavior from commander-in-chief. Um, commander-in-chief, you swagger about as one or two world leaders are currently doing. For communicator-in-chief, um, the style of leadership that works best is a degree of self-sacrifice. Um, lead by behavior from the front, as it were. So radical uncertainty, so different from Europe, don't copy, don't even think of copying America. Very different approach to leadership. But communicator in chief is the key role. And this final point, respond as you go. You're going to need to do things very differently. Um, and that means you need to find new things that work. And then when, when you found things that work, scale them up. Um, so. Let me turn now to the, the second point, which is, which is around health. And it seems to me that so far, Nigeria's policy response to COVID has been a lot better than responses in um, Europe and North America. And that's partly because you have thought of COVID as um, analogous to Ebola. And that's a much better analogy from what Europe thought which was, it's analogous to Spanish flu. Um, so um, what, you, what Nigeria did very successfully with Ebola uh, was test, track, trace. Um, and um, that's really, um, I think that the more you can follow test, track, trace um, with COVID, the better. Um, the, the temporary lockdown alerted people to the need for behavioral change. Um, 
now I think it's, it's definitely served its usefulness. It's alerted people. People now know something potentially dangerous is happening. And what we now need is to, to, to move into what, what's now being thought of as smart um, uh, responses. And what, what is meant by smart responses is you're going to need to do different things in different places at different times as little pockets of, um, of infection um, appear. So different things in different places at different times and often specific to different activities. There are some activities that really need to be closed down, the big public meetings, um, and specific demographically. There are some age groups, namely my own, that are much more at risk um, than the majority of Nigerians who are young. Um, so that sort of, and the, the only way to run that, the only way uh, is to decentralize the response um, and you're very lucky that you've got this structure of states as well as the federal government. And the states are ideally suited to try different things in different places at different times. And then your job is to sort of evaluate and say, ah, oh, this seems to be working, this isn't. Um, uh, and uh, the, there's, a, there's a famous phrase which describes that, that the states, the, the federal, this structure of many states within a federation provides a, a natural laboratory for democracy. You, it's the one structure in which democracy enables different things in different places. Um, Nigeria's health, health COVID shock, the health aspect really is very different from the rest of the world. Um, as those slides are brought out, Nigeria's own health situation um, is, is very different from the rest of the world. You've already got a major health problem, which has nothing to do with COVID. And the vital health priority is to maintain and expand your basic health services. Um, you've got a population which is unhealthy and poor and is going to get poorer. Uh, and so that's the priority, I think, is to try and uh, reduce the deaths from malaria, from the basic uh, killers. Um, and issues like ventilators are frankly irrelevant to the core of Nigeria's health problem. But now let me turn to my main message, which is that the key respect in which uh, the coronavirus hit is so different in Nigeria than in Europe, is that the shock to Nigeria is mainly an economic hit, and it's a very big hit. Uh, it's the fall in the oil price, it's fall in remittances, it's probably some capital flight, and um, all of those things mean you've got a big fall in foreign exchange earnings, a big fall in government revenues, and quite a big fall in ordinary people's capacity to, to spend money, big fall in income and the capacity to spend. Now, on top of that, you've got features which, three features which really amplify that shock. One is, that it's likely to be pretty persistent. The most likely scenario is that this persists for at least three years and probably longer. So on foreign exchange, um, you um, can't diversify your export base. It would have been great if you'd done that in pre the last couple of decades, but it's too late to do that now because world demand uh, for imports is falling. You can lead from the top. I mean, unfortunately, the, the people at the top have to make the biggest sacrifices um, so that we can, they can genuinely become communicators in chief and say, we're all in this together. Raise revenues. Um, uh, Nigeria's had a very, very low share of non-oil tax revenues in GDP, very, very low. Um, Saudi Arabia has just tripled its 
rate of value added tax, tripled it. And the final hit is to people's incomes, incomes of ordinary households and incomes of firms. Fortunately, you've got one big buffer that can work to cushion the household incomes of ordinary people. And that is the informal sector where most ordinary people already get their livelihood. And the, the, my, my advice here is to do everything you can to help the informal sector to grow. Um, so now is not the time to regulate and bully the informal sector. Now is the time to lift all the restrictions that can possibly res be restricted um, uh, to channel finance into the micro enterprise. Um, it's not very expensive, but would help the informal sector. That's the cushion, especially to go back to it, the informal production of food. Paul Collier, thank you so much. President Obasanjo, could I invite you to, to join us in this discussion and to make a comment? I believe that the oil price crash should be used as an advantage because uh, we have paid lip service to diversification of our economy from uh, for decades now. And we move two steps forward and three steps back. Now, maybe this is the time when the issue of uh, diversification of our economy can be taken seriously because we are in an emergency and uh, people will understand that this is an emergency. These things called uh, tough choices, they are not real tough choices. They are necessary choices that we should make right now. Otherwise, we will continue to wallow. President Obasanjo, thank you so much. Um, as ever, um, so crystal clear in the steps that Nigeria could take. Um, before we move to our next speaker, there is one other um, audience member who I would like to call upon just for a, a brief comment on, on what he's heard so far. And that is the Speaker of the House in Nigeria, Femi Bajabi Amila, who I believe is in the audience. And if I could call on you just for a very short comment from, from the floor, Mr. Speaker, it would be an honor. I agree with um, the former president, President Obasanjo, on so many issues here. Not just lip service, but to walk the, to walk, the walk as far as uh, diversification is concerned. And the House of Representatives is taking bold steps, very bold steps in doing this. Uh, we have uh, uh, on the table two, an economic stimulus bill one and an economic stimulus bill two. That is the process of passage. Uh, we have the, the, the social investment program um, by this government, which we are intending to codify and expand. Mr. Speaker, could I, could I ask you, both our speakers, both the former president of Asanjo and Professor Collier, um, talked about the leadership of Nigeria and the, the need for the leadership at this difficult time to make, to be seen to be taking sacrifices. Is this something that the Nigerian House will do? Is it, is it what you think Nigerians leading lawmakers will do? When you do the math, when you do the mathematics, when you compile, when you, when you slash 50% of your salary, it's good. The salary is sometimes uh, not exactly, uh, uh, sometimes exaggerated. But rather than go the salary way, I would rather go cut the perks, totally reduce the perks by even 70%. It is the perks. It is the perks and practices of offices. That is where the money is, as opposed to, as opposed to, as opposed to the salaries. But we're open. Uh, um, if, if that's the way to go, uh, if we do the, the, math, the, the math and we look at the savings from salaries, we'll be more than happy, uh, more than happy. Sacrifices need to be made at this point. I would like to turn now so that this discussion can hear some of the unprecedented things that other countries are doing. And for this, we're very lucky to be joined by the Vice President of the World Bank, Chela Pazabashola, one of the world's most eminent economists. Chela. Thank you, thank you very much. It's a pleasure for me to join this discussion. I want to focus on two issues today, the debt 
and the breadth of this crisis. And as you said, what other oil uh, exporting countries are doing to recover better from it. And if I can leave one message with you, and, and that is, this is going to be a very, very difficult period. This um, COVID-19 pandemic started as a health crisis and has now become an economic crisis. And we forecast that 2020 will see the deepest global recession since World War II. And it's the most synchronized recession with every single country impacted, likely to push 60 to 100 million additional people into extreme poverty. Unfortunately, most of them in sub-Saharan Africa, including Nigeria. We'd always talk about food security. Many of you referred to it already. And with the locust waves and COVID-19, this is an unprecedented crisis for millions of people whose lives and livelihoods are at stake. And as uh, Paul Collier mentioned uh, very well, oil exporting countries have been hit by this dual shock impacting lives and livelihoods. The collapse in oil prices has led to a sharp decline in fiscal revenues as well as in foreign exchange earning. So this is an unprecedented crisis and will require an unprecedented response. And the problem is we started this crisis in a vulnerable position in many countries with record levels of sovereign and uh, corporate debt. So it's very important that the short-term measures to address the health emergency will need to be, that, are, that these short-term measures are accompanied by comprehensive policies to boost long-term growth, in, including by improving governance, business environment, and expanding investment in education and public health. Chela reminds us of something that every speaker has focused on, which is agriculture and the importance of agriculture. But she's added to this debate the need to simplify and speed up government processes and procedures. Um, and of course, this is an opportunity, not least because there is greater technology that's available to do that. But none of that technology will work if the very most talented Nigerians put, don't put their minds to it. And if the public sector doesn't attract the very most talented Nigerians to do that. And so with that, let me turn to one of the very talented Nigerians just mentioned, um, Dr. Folashari Yemi Esan the head of Nigeria's public service, to talk us through what this is looking like for the head of, the, for the head of service. Dr. Yemi Esan. In view of these present circumstances, we are, it is, it is of essence that we fast track the timely implementation of all deliverables. And so we must put in place a technology-driven public service that can accommodate remote work. We must build platforms for community engagement, ownership, and public feedback. We must build a conducive workplace environment for the protection of workers through relevant legislation, policies, and actions and we must promote new values, education, innovation, and productivity in the public service. So what must we do to achieve all this? During the lockdown, we experimented on doing our work digitally and we succeeded. So going forward, we must proactively put in place structures and mechanisms to digitize all administrative processes to ensure improved and seamless running of government business. In this light, the Office of the Head of Service is working with our partners, AIG, towards implementing the following as part of its digitization plan and proposed policy on remote working. Some of the processes that will be digitized immediately include the establishment processes, recruitment processes, learning and development processes, payroll processes, employment management, employee management processes, and many more. Public servants must therefore prepare themselves for the new workplace that will emerge post 
COVID-19. Change management seminars will also be organized to ease the transition to a more digitized workplace. We are also putting new policy directions in place to guide governance going forward. In conclusion, the COVID-19 pandemic is a wake up call to all policymakers, all arms of government and operators of all sectors of the economy in the country to initiate and embrace a more inclusive and integrated multi-sectoral response. Thank you very much. Head of service, thank you so much. Um, Nigeria is lucky to have such a determined and talented and wise head of service. And the, what you've just set up for us are, a, are an ambitious set of policies that only Nigeria could do because of its talent and its people and because of the determination we're hearing this morning to make a difference. Now, I've seen that in the comments and questions and answers, we have a question from the former Emir of Kano, former Central Bank Governor, Mohamed Sanusi, and I would like to bring you in if you could prepare for that, uh, Governor. Um, but just before that, I have a question from Hakim Onasaya, uh, Onasanya, who is one of the AIG fellows at the Blavatnik School this year, doing a Master of Public Policy. My question is to the Head of um, Service and to the um, Speaker of the House of Representatives. The question is, I was very happy, just as many Nigerians, to know that the oral science report is, um, is going to be implemented. But my question is, has your, as the plan is to cut down over 200 agencies into less than 150, how do we manage the political dimensions of it, knowing that some of these agencies are being created and their staff are being recruited as a form of compensation to political loyalists? So are we just reducing the number of agencies and transferring them to other existing agencies, or we are cutting down the number of staff and also number of agencies. Thank you very much. Head of service, as you can see, we, we educate students to ask the really tough questions. My first comment before the Oronsoyo report is that as Nigerians, um, most of us see the public service, the, the civil service as the welfare package for Nigerians, which is very, very wrong. And I think that we must change that narrative. The civil service and the public service is meant to be the engine room of government. And it is what we put into the service that we get. If we use it um, as, patronage, as, as political patronage, then we cannot get much out of the service. The Oronsoye report is a very um, important report that we must look at. The modalities of implementing that report is what the Mr. President has asked that the Secretary to the Government and myself should sit down, look at, and um, come back to him on. Um, like we said earlier on, there's no doubt about it. There are some agencies that are duplicating functions and that is creating a lot of waste. And so we will definitely look at that. We will also look at ways of cutting government spending all in all. Thank you. Thank you so much, Head of Service. Um, could I now ask if, if he's able to join us, um, former Governor uh, Sanusi, His Royal Highness, the former Emir of Kano, if you would like to come in yeah. to put your question. Yeah, thank you very much. Can, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. I, okay. I would like to, um, well, apart from the question, since I have an opportunity to comment, I'd like to make an intervention on this topic. Um, and the first thing I'd like to say is my, uh, well, let me first of all recognize President of and and all the panelists and thank you for an excellent uh, um, session. I've really enjoyed this. Um, the first thing I'd like to say is, from where I stand, I don't say do a nation recognize the urgency of the situation we're facing and the depth of the crisis, the fiscal crisis facing the country. 
uh, on the eve of COVID and the collapse of the oil price, the Nigerian government was already spending over 60% of its revenue on debt service. And what was left was not enough to cover recurrent expenditure. Um, with oil production costs at um, over $20 a barrel, I'm not sure that at $30, $40, we're able to even cover debt service. Um, so, so the reality is we do need to take a hard look at the structure of the country and understand that some of the decisions we took many decades ago do have implications for the cost structure of governance. This, this morning's discussion so far has made me optimistic um, because we've heard that Nigeria has to face up to a huge crisis, that its political structure needs reform. But we've heard one of Nigeria's most eminent political leaders, um, the Speaker of the House and the former president, talking about the kinds of sacrifices they are now willing to make. We've heard that Nigeria's civil service desperately needs change. We've heard the head of service lay out an ambitious program for change. We've heard that Nigeria's graduates now need to rise up, to go out, to teach, to make a difference. And we've heard a young graduate currently studying at Oxford um, wanting to do that. And he's joined, and you'll see in the Q&A, by many other AIG scholars willing to do this. And we've heard Nigeria's business leaders are going to have to step up their game um, and be nimble and adaptive, but also to help those other sectors achieve their goals. And I'd like to turn to one of Nigeria's most outstanding business leaders, Igboje Aikimokwere, to conclude this session with his of what the opportunities that face Nigeria are. Ike, over to you. The summary of, um, of where we find ourselves is that we face big and unprecedented challenges that require uh, tough decisions, smart spending, fast action um, in three areas. Revenue, revenue generation, uh, resetting government priorities, and improving the indicators as a result of better performance on the part of government. Um, and the opportunities that, that are summarized on this slide, are the first is bring the public sector into the digital age. Uh, the head of service spoke very, very, very uh, eloquently about this. This will change Nigeria. Uh, and what we essentially need to do is digitalize core processes. If I think about my time and what Access Bank has continued to do, what we, what we found out was that by spending something like 200 million Naira in digitalizing core processes, and when I left Access Bank, we were probably at 10% of digitalizing the core processes. I understand they are over 90% now. They spent 200 million Naira, and they have annual savings of 2 billion Naira. A one-time spend to digitalize your core processes of 200 million naira has led to annual savings of 2 billion naira. So imagine the civil service and maybe 20 of the most important agencies of government digitalizing. And this can be done, I understand, in 18 months to 24 months. You know, this will just change Nigeria. Um, introducing performance management into the public sector. Transparency, transparency, transparency. Why don't we have an index every year published for all Nigerians to see? discussed by the president in council with the ministers, the head of service, which shows the performance of the ministries and so on. Let them have their scorecard discussed, just like you have in any other business. Of course, um, Nigerians rise to the challenge. We love the challenge of performance. I know for a fact that if we change the performance management system in the public sector, we are going to see improved performance. Public-private partnership to scale up delivery of basic services particularly around the, the area of digital infrastructure. We are thinking about transforming the economy, the SMEs and the middle class. What if we had a digital registry in Nigeria run by government in partnership with the private sector where every invoice in Nigeria, every business invoice in Nigeria is registered. And if you give the, the so here I am, I supply you Naira, I supply you a, a Nigerian SME, an item and you accept my invoice, and I register that invoice in the, in, the, in the registry. If that invoice becomes as good as cash, it will transform value chains, it will transform supply chains, it will transform the understanding of credit in Nigeria. All we need is a speaker to pass a law that enables such, such a partnership between government and the private sector. Redefine jobs, 
reskill employees, ship personnel to areas of value, agri workers, uh, teachers, digital workers, call centers, where essential services are rendered to the public, first responders. Something very critical is that I think that we can communicate much more effectively as government. And doing so will mobilize citizens to take collective action. We must be proactive. Use of influencers, use of social media, and most importantly, the, the deficit in trust, which will be won when public leaders begin to demonstrate sacrifices of the nature that uh, the speaker has publicly made uh, uh, available to us to hear today. Of course, revenue mobilization and diversification, expense reduction. I have no doubt that if the spirit of this discussion permeates the spirit of what the Nigerian government does from this moment on, Nigeria will never be the same again. Thank you, Nairi. Thank you very much. Um, I, I'm aware that we're now over time and I would like to conclude this session today first by thanking all the participants and attendees. I hope you've all opened the Q&A because there are some truly brilliant comments in that and it pains me that we have not been able to um, go through all those questions as a panel. But I would like to thank first Vice President of the World Bank, Chela Pazabashwala, who got up at 4 a.m. this morning to join us and gave us that very practical guidance and advice from other countries that the bank is working with to respond quickly to this crisis. I'd like to thank Professor Paul Collier from the Blavatnik School of Government for his wise words, his clear prioritization um, around, around leadership, around health measures, and mainly around the economy and the things that Nigeria needs to do. I'd like to thank the head of service, Dr. Yemi Ersan, not just for her, her, her contribution this morning, but for her public service to Nigeria and her vision and ambition. And I hope that everybody on this call will help her to achieve that vision. I'd like to thank the Speaker of the House for joining us today and showing Nigerians that every part of Nigeria is willing now to take up this crisis and to make the necessary moves. I'd like to thank former President Obasanjo, whose wisdom is always enriches every debate that's ever held about where Nigeria is going. And to the former governor and um, Emir of Kano for his um, deep shakeup about how we need to look even beyond the opportunities that we've concluded with today at the, some of the way Nigeria has been structured to ask if it can really win in the 21st century with that structure. But last and certainly not least, I'd like to thank our partner in Nigeria, Aikboje Aikimukwere, whose vision in the private sector has shown how Nigeria can succeed and whose willingness and determination to, to throw his talent and energy and his colleagues' talent and energy to helping the public sector improve in Nigeria is, is you know, one of the kinds of initiatives that will help Nigeria really come out of this crisis stronger than ever before. Thank you all so much. It's been terrific to engage with you this morning and good luck. <laughs>